Uh, good morning and uh, welcome to day three of the urbanism. My name is uh, Piero Vanassoy with the expertise in EU sustainable urban mode. And I will be the moderator of this session today. I am also happy to be joined by the speakers that I will shortly introduce. This session has a creation of key labor for urban mobility. Given enough attention by urban mobility professionals last year, also to, due to the COVID pandemic, both in urban transport spheres and also in mainstream media. The conditions of platform workers involved in urban transport and logistics, food delivery riders, and ride aid. Also, on the implications of this working condition on urban and on road safety. Working conditions that um, we will see are to the business model of this. Thanks to the contributions, uh, we will provide an overview of the business and labor models on which this digital platform and how impacts of these models on platform and how workers have been increased both at local level and also increasingly at internet. Additional health, uh, health and safety issues, logistics platform workers, which is a crucial dimension, which also links very closely to safety for all road users. We will hear about the work underway at European level regarding and workers, which will lead to a European level legislative program. Of the but uh, before presenting our speakers, I the audience with a couple of basic housekeeping rules that uh, will guide us through the session. You can <clears throat> session. You can write your comments in the chat on the right, and ask questions in the Q and A uh, in the Q and A area also on the right hand side of your screen. You can also view who is attending. And the section in the people's tab by hiding in the chat or tapping the full screen. That this meeting is being and we available online after the call. Uh, and the brief reminders to uh, to speakers uh, to please keep your microphone muted when not speaking as any uh, audio disruption. After this. Uh, check under the events tab, the general event chat, post uh, attending the, um, the Urbanism Next Europe conference, general Q&A tabs. Uh, on the left-hand side of your screen, you can discover the questions and send messaging uh, message participants. And now, without I would like to um, present and introduce uh, the speakers of this section today, starting from Professor Vina Dubal of the University of California at Hastings, live for the session as she is based in California, but who kindly agreed to send a contribution. And I would like to thank her very much for that. Then give the floor to Jake Thomas, representative of the IWGB uh, Union, Independent Workers of Great Delivery Rider. Uh, working for Deliveroo. We will then host the contribution of senior lecturer at the Open University and London. Christy, Professor of Transport Safety at the University College. Last presentation of the European Commission on DG Employment. Okay, and start with the first presentation. Stop sharing my screen. Our first presentation, which, as mentioned, will be a video for Bina Dubal of University of California at Hastings, an overview based on the research of Professor Dubal, uh, building blocks on which platform companies base their uh, business and employment models. 
she will also provide an explanation of the historical, legal, and social context that allow this model to surge. This will really uh, be the scene setter of today and will help us understand where gig economy models, as we see them now, come from. And give us also an idea of the direction in the future might head. And stop here now. Let's start uh, with the first presentation of the day. Hello, my name is um, Professor Vina Dubal. I teach uh, labor and employment law in California, Hastings, and I'm so honored to be here today um, to talk to you about inequality in the so-called platform economy. So at the turn of the 19th century, the cotton mill was symbolically equated with new industrial society. As uh, English historian E.P. Thompson famously noted, the cotton mill was a piece of industrial technology that represented new forms of production and the social relationships that um, arose through these new forms of production. And just as observers in the mid 1800s were intrigued by the novelty of the factory and the technologies associated with it, I think today policymakers and academics and media analysts are really um, are interested in this particular digital moment, um, sort of consumed by the novelty of app-based technologies and the so-called transformation of service work through um, labor platform companies in particular. And in this widespread discussion about labor platform work and analysis, Uber, both the corporate entity app, has become symbolic, um, has become the symbolic cotton mill to today's service sector. But we know historically that the cotton mill wasn't the driving force behind the massive political, social, and economic transform transformation of the Industrial Revolution. Rather, the transformation was attributable not to the machine, but to capital's restructuring of work around the machine, to the state's restructuring of, of, um, of work, and to the collective resistance of the working class amidst these sort of public and, and private reorderings of work. So in my making, what we see with the platform-based service economy is not at all analogous to the Industrial Revolution in size or in scale. Um, indeed, the US Bureau of Labor Statistics released numbers in 2019 to suggest that the service-based gig economy is much smaller than imagined. Um, and while it accounts for, for some 4% of US work, platform-based gig work represents our collective anxieties about digitalization, um, the so-called transformation of service work, and the political pathologies and economic inequalities associated with widespread labor deregulation. So while it's still a very small part of our economy in the U.S., presents the potential, you know, uberization of the service sector more broadly is, um, is why I think it is so important to study. Um, it, in so much as it represents the intensification of labor trends witnessing for the past 40 years um, and really a new moral world of work, I think it's very much worthy of our attention. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend the remainder of my brief um, 10 minutes today talking about the legal and historical and shifts to this um, in-person platform economy based on my almost one decade studying ride hail work um, that is the taxi to Uber economy in the San Francisco Bay Area where all of this started. So my own focus on Uber um, began very much by accident. I was a public interest attorney in 2008 representing taxi workers in San Francisco. Um, taxi workers like Uber drivers have been considered independent contractors since roughly the 1970s, when taxis companies rid themselves of unions through business reordering and um, in, a sh in a shift from supplying wages to their workers to renting taxi to drivers. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen briefly um, so you can see some of what I hope to convey visually. 
So, um, you know, I, I started this work um, some time ago um, in in the taxi economy, um, and then sort of started forced to study the Uber um, Uber and Lyft world. So, so cab companies, as I were amongst the first the first companies to take advantage of the independent car contractor carve out in federal labor law. Um, so in the US, as in many other places in the world, all of our rights um, related to security flow through employment. If you're an employee, you have access to the minimum wage, workers' compensation, unemployment insurance, you have the right to um, you have safety, safety and health protections. Um, you, you know, potentially have access to to a pension, to um, to retirement and disability, to prohibitions against discrimination. If you're an independent contractor, any of these things, um, because all of these rights are attached to employee status, employment is more expensive than um, than having workers that you just contract with. So costs employers about one third more to have employees than to have, um, you know, workers who, who they classify as independent contractors. You saw cab companies um, among the first to experiment soon after these laws were passed in, in the 1930s, um, experiment with the independent contractor model. So they basically wrote the federal government and said, look, if we start renting our vehicles to taxi drivers instead of paying them by the to make them independent contractors. And the government said yes, the IRS said yes, they were able to de-unionize the industry by doing that. Workers started paying for their shifts, they leased the car for about 10 hours a day and um, could do, you know, whatever they wanted during, during that time period. Um, and for roughly 30 years from 1980, late, early 1980s, full-time taxi drivers had a relatively stable but low income because driver advocates lobbied to curtail taxi supply and to control the price of their lease and the taxi fare. So following these dec decades, um, San Francisco taxi situation that taxi workers all over the world soon were to encounter in 2013 um, that they could not have predicted economic devastation, which happened almost overnight. So between 2012 and 2013, these new ride hail apps, Uber, Lyft, um, enabled drivers in, um, in California and San Francisco to operate outside the state and municipal regulatory frameworks for taxi drivers. So they enlisted unrestricted numbers of, um, of commercially unlicensed drivers to download the centralized dispatching app on their smartphones and use their personal vehicles to pick up and drop off, um, drop off riders. So they sort of passed, because they were working outside of the existing re regulations and de um, demanded that their workers utilize their own vehicles and pay for gas and um, take on all of the financial and legal risks, they were sort of one step removed, more precarious than taxi companies. Um, soon, as a result of the very tight knit relationship between the tech lobbyists and um, and California regulators, California legalized this model, this Uber model of work. Um, Almost overnight, all of the regulations that workers had fought for and maintained for over a century to protect consumers and workers in the ride hail industry disappeared. And policy makers heralded these new companies um, as innovation, as a new form of consumer convenience. Uh, the regulations, I should note, were completely silent on labor issues, on, on how workers were to be treated by the companies. Um, these regulations that were silent on worker issues and frankly quite silent on consumer uh, safety issues as well ended up becoming replicated all over the world. Again, unlike taxi drivers, these drivers, transportation network company is what the regulators call them, the Uber drivers have no set income, they pay for their own gasoline, they drive with no regulatory limit on and as an additional regression, um, they also have to drive their own cars, bear the costs of wear and tear, purchase gas and hybrid insurance, pay for vehicle upkeep, all the while having their on-the-job behaviors incentive.
bias and shaped by algorithms. Um, in, in California, we know that the vast majority of drivers um, uh, make below the minimum wage um, and um, oftentimes do not account for um, when calculating their own um, their own income don't account for all of their expenses expenses and don't realize how, how little money they they are making and um, and when they do many many drivers end up quitting and so what you have is a pool of vulnerable, precarious um, uh, workers, mostly immigrants, mostly subordinated racial minorities. Um, in roughly 2016, labor unions and drivers themselves started to realize as their wages were dropping, 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 um, exactly how precarious this work was. And they started to try and address it. So there were some sort of labor groups that believe that the best route to address the rise of this um, of this independent contractor work was to fight for employee status, um, to say that these drivers were being misclassified under the law. And then others sought a more contentious and expedient route, which was to compromise the thing. They look, we'll, we'll give up on employment status if you give us a central worker association where we can maybe um, advocate on behalf of drivers um, in, in some limited sense. Inhibiting the companies from, uh, or sorry, the, the unions and labor groups who were trying to fight for the employee status of these workers, what had inhibited them from really investing in fighting for their the workers' rights was that um, in, in the U.S. as elsewhere, if you actually are contractor workers um, to raise wages, you can be you can be um, accused of price fixing, of attempting to price fix um, for under US laws. So there was some financial to invest in organizing this workforce. Um, and so workers started organizing themselves. You had a lot of grassroots um, organizations. Um, and those grassroots organizations fought for um, what became known as AB5 in California, which made it very clear that these workers were um, uh, employees under the state law. So they deserved minimum wage, overtime, unemployment insurance, and workers' compensation. Um, it was one of the first big victories anywhere in the world against these companies. Um, and there was a lot of, um, of, of incentive, um, incentives, a lot of incentives built in for the state to enforce the law against the companies. Just as AB5 went into, um, went into effect, the pandemic. And so we had a bunch of workers wondering why they weren't getting um, paid as, as much as they had hoped under the law. Um, and work disappeared overnight. Um, and at the same time, the same time that, that this work disappeared overnight, the companies were trying to get themselves out from under the law. So we have a system of direct, direct democracy in California where you can put, um, if you get enough signatures, you can put laws on the ballot. And so the companies put um, to, to get themselves carved out of the law, to, car to get themselves out from under having to provide employment protections, they pass uh, a Prop 22. Um, I have written quite a bit about Prop 22. It is what I call the new racial wage code. It establishes a third category of worker for um uh, delivery network company workers and transportation network company workers, that's food delivery workers and ride hail drivers who are using um, an app to be dispatched work. And the key thing about Prop 22 is that um, it creates an area where the companies do not have to pay for all the time that the workers are laboring. They only have to pay for um, the time after a work a um, affair, which means that some 40 to 60 percent of the time workers are, are working, they do not get paid. So it legalizes peace payment. Um, they don't get reimbursed expenses during waiting time, uh, kind of, of employment benefits as, like breaks or paid sick leave or workers' compensation if they're injured on the job or unemployment insurance. And um, economists have calculated this amounts to about $5.64 hour
uh, less than the half the minimum wage in California. And um, I call this a new racial wage code because this is essentially a new law that applies only to this particular workforce that is primarily made up of subordinated racial minorities. So in the Bay Area, we know that 78% of workers, um, almost 80% of workers are immigrants and people of color. Um, and so what next? Um, the companies are now trying um, uh, pass in other states rely on this notion that drivers want flexibility, that they don't want um, employment status, or something are not uh, necessarily, uh, they, they, can, they can coexist together, um, but they're sort of trying to, 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 to uh, proliferate this myth all over and Canada, and now um, potentially also I see in, in the UK, um, it is uh, my, my basic position um, based on this many years of, of research is that um, if these different locales end up um, legalizing what amounts to be paid, you will see growing um, not just economic inequality, but growing specifically um, racialized economic inequality, and 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 for um, and for that very reason, I think it's very important that we um, that regulators and others um, stand up against this sort of these sorts of company company backlogs. Thank you. A key economy model from from right patient providers. And the unionization on drivers' wage, lobbying regulators, and the so called California proposition. The digital self employed labor model that platform companies are now open to application also in Europe. That flexibility and the employment protection cannot go hand in hand. And this is a great introduction that leads uh, to our next contribution by Jay Tom, of the IP, the leader writer, who will provide us with an account of these experiments as a good. A direct perspective on both personal and institutional problems that we are facing. Hi, right, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, hi, my name is Jake. I'm 21. I'm a delivery rider and more recently a member of the IWGB union, a union that's dedicated to supporting independent workers such as couriers, cleaners, private hire drivers, as we just heard about, uh, and plus yoga and cycling teachers, game developers, basically the workers who don't offer to go to with problems and are frequently left isolated from support. Uh, this isolation seems to be a pathology of the platform economy, uh, individualizing the financial struggle of its workers and relying on that individualization to generate profits for its shareholders. So I joined Deliveroo almost three years ago now, enamored by this promise of flexibility, being able to choose the time and the frequency of my shifts to fit around my temperamental university schedule. A few days after sending in my application, I was invited to a meeting with a few other applicants to provide our necessary documents, background checks, and was incredibly quickly able to access the Rider app and begin earning money. However, I soon out found out that the flexibility I was promised in promotional material was greatly outshone by the huge problems myself and other riders were beginning to face, including a lack of orders, unresponsive rider support and constantly falling fees. These problems often see little temporary solutions in small improvements to the app, occasional fee boosts and very, very rare hiring freezes, but they also seem to be symptomatic of the platform model that Deliveroo has, more specifically the classification of the riders as being self-employed. So the contradiction in the classification can be demonstrated by the vacant promise of being your own boss, implying this degree of control over your work. But as a rider, your work is for and through the Deliveroo app, waiting for orders rather than actively seeking out work and having large percentages of your fees going to the company. Deliveroo is your boss when it's convenient to them, when they have an opportunity to control your pay and benefit from your labor, but absolve themselves from responsibility when it comes to sick pay, 
injuries, the frequency of your work uh, by use of this self-employment loophole, claiming that it is not in fact them, but the rider that's in control. So towards the start of the pandemic, when it became very clear that delivery would be playing a much larger role in people's lives, delivery began to hire more and more riders whilst pay continued to fall. A massive overpopulation of riders logged on at any given time meant less orders and less pay. With the Bureau of, Investig uh, the Bureau of Investigative Journalism finding that a third of riders were paid below minimum wage, some earning as little as two pounds an hour. I found myself repeatedly in situations where I'd be standing out with my bike waiting for up to two hours or more at what was supposedly peak times before I could get a single order, often afraid to log off the app, not wanting to miss that potential four pound payout of an order were to come just after I went offline. When on shift, the odds seem to be stacked against you pretty much at every turn. Restaurants are often hostile to riders. I've been denied use of toilets and facilities on multiple occasions. Long waiting times mean more time to complete an order with no change to the fee. And accessibility issues mean that moped and motorbike riders sometimes have to park distances away and walk through pedestrianised areas to reach their destinations, which usually results in cold food, late orders, and in extreme cases, the termination of the rider for taking too long. Another case of the worker having no control over the conditions of their work. The introduction of discriminatory facial ID recognition has also led to the unfair termination of riders, disproportionately affecting black and minority ethnic members of the workforce, and once causing the termination of a rider simply because he grew facial hair over the weekend. Though conditions were bad, riders continued to deliver during the pandemic, getting meals to people who were self-isolating and unable to go to the shops, constantly putting themselves and their families at risk. Riders had to self-isolate without support from the company and often unnecessarily put their health at risks, not wanting to miss a day from work. I've heard stories from riders at waiting spots about accidents they'd had on the road and a lack of compensation from the company, about extreme hours they've had to work in in an attempt to get close to the living wage. All the while, we kept delivering whilst delivery was set to make millions, preparing for an IPO on the London Stock Exchange in 2021. This model relies really heavily on an internal competition between the workers. The idea that even if large chunks of the workforce choose to quit, to strike or to work for another delivery company, that this will incentivize remaining workers or workers to be to work more with an increased chance of getting orders due to the depleted population of riders logged on, creating this almost market system of supply and demand balance, the commodity being the labor of the riders themselves. Through the loophole of self-employment, uh, Deliveroo are able to avoid spending more than the exact amount necessary to meet the demand of customers, with large amounts of idle labour in the form of riders being logged onto the app with unpaid waiting times, ready to work when needed, but unpaid all the other times. Though Deliveroo rely on a lack of unity within their workforce, riders from all platforms have a propensity to organise and unite. And in my case, that unity is taken the form of the IWGB. I was recruited online after the monumental victory for Uber drivers being classified as workers and the Supreme Court ruling that flexibility of gig economy jobs did not come at the price of basic workers' rights. And I began to get involved in the planning of our demonstration on the 7th of April, the day of the IPO in London, to demand those basic workers' rights and an end to the exploitation of our workforce. Within the workforce are a range of people with different commitments to the job, from teenagers logging on for some extra pocket money, to people working more than full time to support families, often having to work through the night with delivery offering boosts to fees until as late as 4 a.m. to make a decent living wage. Through the union, I've managed to overcome the efforts of delivery to split up their workforce and have managed to meet many riders from many backgrounds, including strongly knit communities of migrant workers with inspiring levels of solidarity. The migrant worker presence with couriers is very prevalent and riders in the past have been targeted for immigration checks, as well as having to face racist abuse and harassment whilst on the job. Through direct traction and the strength of community within the IWGB and couriers in general, we've been able to secure many victories for riders, including reactivation of accounts of many unfairly terminated riders, the option to decline orders that may be unsafe, the introduction of a transport focus group in York and funding to uh, a new funding for rider access permits in the largely pedestrianised city centre, working with platforms to introduce text-based rider support for deaf workers and arguably a hand in the disastrous valuation of delivery in what has been described as one of the worst IPOs in history. Through these demonstrations and victories, there seems to be a growing consciousness 
both within the workforce and in the public, that we don't have to settle for the poor conditions and the lack of basic rights that currently exist, and that we can change things for the better when we work together. Though the scales of power are obviously heavily weighted towards the side of the multi-billion pound company, the poor valuation of delivery after the IPO and the protests all over the country showed us that investors are backing away from what looks to be an unsustainable model of employment that's being condemned and is under attack internationally. We as delivery riders know ourselves that basic workers' rights and flexibility are obviously not incompatible, and the Supreme Court ruling confirming this is a long overdue step to securing the rights we need. And through collective action, we can force platform economy companies to treat their workers with the respect that we deserve. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very interesting um, presentation. I think that uh, if I may, um, on a very interesting uh, on the different composition of the food delivery workforce in uh, this case, and uh, how uh, uh, these different groups have come together to advance demands of uh, better conditions and. And I think that this is also uh, prove that the common narrative that the platform adopts, uh, these are workers, these are just uh, people that get some extra money in a relaxed way, is uh, at least for a significant part of the workforce um, misleading uh, at best. And, uh, and, and um, the presentation also is how um, a response to the, to the usual question, uh, why do you work at, uh, at Libero or Uber or platform companies and why do you accept um, some minimum ways? I think that you um, you highlighted very well um, how uh, the, um, uh, the language can also uh, not be a, a, a barrier uh, for uh, workers. And, um, and I think that uh, uh, we can uh, we can see how uh, this this choice uh, is uh, and, and, uh, and negative uh, coercion that comes from economic uh, pressure. And uh, um, I think that uh, this was a uh, very very uh, underlined. Um, would you like to to have a, a brief comment further on this? Um. Yeah, just in, in terms of uh, the uh, the idea of sort of uh, people questioning why you still work for these companies and stuff, a lot of these people who were couriers before uh, the platform economy kind of took over that profession have basically been forced to engage with gig economy stuff where they would have, you know, perfectly reasonable hourly wages and often have signed up to basically every courier platform you could think of they've got about 12 apps on their phone screen and they're logged into all of them all the time because it's not sustainable to be able to have one job one employer where you would 10 years ago you're now sort of scrounging for every single scrap you can get so for a lot of people it's not necessarily just the employment that is the problem it's the fact that the entire profession uh, the entire industry itself has been engulfed by the gig economy leaving basically no space other than uh, to accept this classification of being self-employed where you didn't have to once. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, And uh, I will now uh, pass the floor to uh, Woodcook, who will uh, take the presentation through the dynamics underpinning current changes in the gig economy and also provide some, uh, some reflection on why these changes are important. Uh, uh, Thank you, Piero. And yeah, I, I, I want to start off by saying I think it's very important to follow uh, Jake uh, as a speaker who who has a direct experience of uh, of working in the gig economy, because I think far too often these discussions about how work is changing or or, or what this means for for the city or for transport don't feature the experiences of people who who are doing this as a job um, and what I want to talk about is is a period of research uh, not quite as long as uh, as Vina's 10 years of studying 
uh, uh, taxi transportation in, in San Francisco, but a period of, uh, of five years uh, of research with food delivery workers, um, with taxi transport, um, and with online uh, platform workers that, that, that I've been doing both in the UK, but also uh, in India and in South Africa, uh, and a bit too in, in North America. And I want to talk a bit about what I've come to think of as, as the ways that, that, that workers respond in the gig economy and why we, as academics, as policymakers, uh, and as people interested in, in transport, uh, in a broader sense, should pay attention to what's happening with these new forms of organizing that, that, that Jake has outlined, but also with the, the concerns and the demands that these workers are, are, are putting forward. The first thing that I want to say is that when I started doing research in this area, um, many people said that these kinds of workers would be unorganizable, uh, that they were different to you know, more established trade unionized industries uh, that working on a bicycle or, or, or a moped or indeed uh, hiring your own car to work in transport and using an app to access work would somehow mean that people couldn't, uh, couldn't organize. Uh, and many commentators blamed the precarious nature of the work, uh, that these workers were young or that they were migrants, that the nature of work had somehow changed, that technology meant that it wasn't possible to, to organize collectively, or some kind of combination of all of these things. And I think as Jake has outlined very well, uh, these arguments have, have been proven wrong in practice. Um, so in the UK and uh, across Europe and elsewhere, Delivery riders have been involved in many strikes. Uh, they've built networks across cities and countries. And indeed now uh, with the, the, the strike and the protests over, uh, uh, over Deliveroo's IPO internationally. Um, and in a way, some of the things that commentators pointed out would be a problem for organizing, the use of technologies, the, the app-based nature of the work has indeed played a role in facilitating uh, how people organize. Um, so WhatsApp and social media playing a, a, an important role in how these workers organize. And so the first time I ever met a delivery rider uh, in London, uh, walking around uh, central London, talking to people uh, uh, outside restaurants, was seeing that these riders were already in, in contact with each other. Uh, WhatsApp groups uh, spreading across the city, becoming in-person uh, becoming like an office water cooler, not necessarily in person or in person outside of a restaurant, but places that people came together to discuss their grievances and talk about the issues they had with their work. Um, and this is an experience that is repeated wherever people find work and, and do work together uh, and work in similar conditions, workers try to find ways to talk about uh, their work, to share their stories about it, to think about strategies for overcoming the problems of it and so on. Um, and so like Vina, I want to paraphrase uh, E.P. Thompson, but a different uh, E.P. Thompson quote. But when E.P. Thompson writes about uh, workers coming together in the cotton mills in, uh, in the UK, um, he writes about how workers were present at their own making. The people that went to work in cotton mills didn't come with a blank history or, or, or no experiences before they came to the cotton mills. And the same is true of platform workers, that platform workers were present at their own making, to, to paraphrase Thompson, that people have a history before signing up to work on these platforms. They bring this with them to work, their experiences of working elsewhere, perhaps of being in a trade union or resisting work elsewhere their existing social networks, their politics, their needs and wants and things that they want to get from the work. And so across my research, I found three, what I'm gonna call moments of solidarity that I want to talk about that I think stem from uh, what Jake has talked about, but also things that repeat in other contexts and other countries. The first is that there is an increasing connection between platform workers that they're not isolated, that platform workers find ways to meet other platform workers, to join WhatsApp groups or Facebook groups, to 
turn those meeting points outside restaurants into longer connections, to form worker networks, to join trade unions. The second is that, and this builds in many ways on, on, on what Vino has argued, that there is a lack of communication from platforms to workers. That the trick of self-employment is not only one of freeing platforms from paying uh, social benefits or, or, or healthcare or, or, or whatever it might be, but also creates a, a communication barrier that platforms don't want to appear as if they're an employer. So they refuse to negotiate with workers because if they negotiate and if they provide proper training and if they communicate effectively, it might make it look like they're employers rather than these self-employed uh, relationships. But what this creates is an escalating, uh, escalating action from workers around, around shared issues. That if you don't communicate, uh, you don't negotiate, in many forms of work, this can be a pressure valve. Uh, you work in a supermarket, you don't get the shifts you want, a supervisor tells you, you know, you'll get better shifts in the future or we'll do something else to, to, to ameliorate things. In platform work, this doesn't happen. There's very little ability to, uh, to mediate smaller problems that workers have in, at, at work. So instead, these things escalate. The third point that I want to, to discuss is the internationalization uh, of this work. And I mean this both in a sense of Uber spreading from country to country and to city to city, uh, or Deliveroo spreading across Europe and into other countries, but also that this cre creates an internationalization of workers shared experiences. There are many forms of work today that happen all over the world with shared conditions. Uh, think of security guards or cleaners uh, or, or, or many other kinds of low paid work. But there often isn't a reason for security guards in France, in America, in India, in the UK to come into contact with each other, to share their experiences of work and to talk about common ways of, uh, of trying to change their work. But with the Ubers and the deliveries of, these, uh, 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 of this world, there is a shared experience that goes across international borders. An Uber driver in South Africa uh, sees themselves as working for the same company as an Uber driver in India or an Uber driver in, uh, in the UK. And so there is a reason to seek each other out, to build connections, to share stories, to think about how the work could be organized differently. And I think in a way, this is what's so powerful uh, in the, 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 the strike and the demonstration that Jake talked about around the IPO, is we start to see the beginnings of a new and internationalized movement uh, fighting for better conditions for, for many of these urban workers. And so in a way we can say that whilst these platforms are reshaping work in uh, an important and quite fundamental ways, they're also reshaping uh, a new group of workers across international borders who show us what work could be like in a different way. You know, how could food delivery uh, or transportation be organized differently? How could it benefit more than just the shareholders and owners of platforms, but how could it reshape uh, our cities uh, and the experience of work to deliver for, for many, many more people? And so uh, what I want to finish on is to say that I think that uh, that is the thing we should be looking at when we look at, uh, at, at feeding the giant and at, at the platform economy. But if E.P. Thompson said that platform workers were present at their own making, if we can paraphrase him into the future, we can also see uh, that platform workers will be central in transforming this work, not only for themselves, but for many, many other workers more broadly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jamie, for your insightful uh, presentation. Uh, not only at local level, not only in cities, but also uh, internationally. Um, I think that you really point out uh, not only the, uh, among uh, uh, right hand drivers, who delivery workers, but also other kind of platform workers. Um, you, I think you 
we point out on how this is not a authority, it's a struggle by the lady. But uh, as we think in working condition and they go out for a whole better of, um, of workers that could uh, become even, uh, even bigger when, uh, um, uh, in, in time. And um, to this end, I would like to um, um, ask you this question. Uh, do you see it as a, as a, as a way forward for, uh, for platform workers, such as, for example, delivery riders, uh, to cope? Uh, as we have seen already in the UK with uh, hospitality workers and uh, possibly even, uh, even restaurant owners. Yeah, I, th I think that's uh, I think that's an excellent question. Uh, your audio is a little uh, a little fuzzy for me. I don't know if it it is for other people, but I I, I think I got the the thrust of it. I, I think this is what's so interesting about transport workers, in a way, um, that transport workers don't you know work within a a kind of limited area or or, or encounter only other transport workers is historically transport workers have played a very important role of connecting people, uh, of connecting people not only through their work, but also connecting people with experiences of how others work or, or, or stories about how other people have, have, uh, have resisted or organized. And where I am in London, uh, in an area that used to be docks many, many years ago, dock workers played a key role, as did shipping workers, of, of spreading those stories, of thinking about uh, what was happening elsewhere and I think in a way workers like Jake and, and, and food delivery workers you know who come into contact with restaurant workers or, or, or bar workers or, or other taxi workers can play a role of talking about how, how work can be different uh, and in the UK we've seen this with McDonald's workers building connections with, uh, with food delivery workers um, and so I think it's, a, a, it's an exciting moment of seeing how rather than being you know uh, isolated or, or, or completely alienated, that these new groups of workers can play a, a role in the labour movement um, in not only trying to transform their conditions, but also also help with other uh, other people's struggles. I hope that you. Okay. Um, let's now go uh, to the next uh, presentation uh, and, and go more in depth. Safety for workers, a fundamental aspect of that. Workers involved in that. Services. And I. Uh, University College of London, who authored a study uh, which focuses on, on workers that are category and that are not covered by employment protections, many of which provide logistics and transport uh, service uh, based service. Uh, and Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk about gig workers from a road safety perspective, and I'm talking about a perfect storm of risk factors because everything that I know that relates to the causation of crashes is kind of totally um, shown in, in the gig work. So what do we do? So you all know what the gig economy is. It involves people who get paid, um, don't get paid a salary, but get paid per per gig or per uh, at piece rate. And where service providers are linked to service users by an app. So what do we do? 
So we wanted to talk to people and it was very interesting to talk about giving people a voice and the ethnography of understanding the risks that people experience. So we did 48 in-depth interviews with drivers, riders and their managers and these drivers and riders. So there'd be drivers who were delivering parcels or drivers that were taxi services and riders who were motorcy motorcyclists delivering food or people on, on pedal cycles. And after we'd done these interviews to get a real insight into what were the kind of road safety issues that they were experiencing, we did an online survey, um, which we got over 200 responses to, and it is published in this work in the Transport and Health Journey uh, Journal. So in terms of safety management, so what did our, the people that we talked to say about it? They said that the companies were only interested in the life of the parcel and not the person delivering it. So as an example, if someone crashed, the first thing that they would say is, OK, well, what's happened to the food or what's happened to the parcel? We need to get it to someone and not caring about the person who was delivering it. There was, in terms of safety, there was no training given. There was no safety equipment and generally a disregard for safety. And this really does link to not seeming to be an employer. So this is what the interview said. So then we, we constructed a questionnaire. And we asked these questions and to get a quantitative response. So we found again, no safety training, no safety equipment, such as a high visibility vest. And some people actually saying, no, we don't want you to wear any of our branded um, uh, high vis vests because, you know, we don't want to look like an, an employer. They felt that the company does not care about their safety while whilst working, but this responsibility should be shared. So it's not just about being employed. Um, you know, if you're if you're a gig worker, that the company that is employed effectively employing you does have responsibility. Fatigue is obviously a major factor in um, doing this kind of work. People are getting in and out of cars. They are going up flights of steps. They are walking long distances. So in our interviews, people said they were mentally and physically fatigued and mentally fatigued because often they're working in complex urban areas where there's a lot going on, physically fatigued from getting on and off or in and out of cars. And as um, someone said earlier, they do work for multiple courier companies and some working three weeks of 12 hour days without a break. And I didn't think this was possible, but apparently one cyclist reported that they fell asleep on, she fell asleep on her bike and sub subsequently crashed. And talking to other very keen cyclists, apparently this is possible. One of the drivers we spoke to said he had to slap his face to keep awake and travelled at only 50 miles per hour on the motorway to limit any damage if he crashed. And some of the people who were um, providing app-based taxi services also had long commutes, so two hours to get into London to work. And when we talked to people in our survey, we asked them, do you know, did they ever struggle to stay awake when they were working? And 16% said they did suffer this severe fatigue. We all know that, I mean, mobile phone use is equivalent to, if you're actually holding a phone, interacting with your phone, it's equivalent to being something like three times over the drink drive limit because your distraction, your, you're not focusing on the road. Um, most people in the interview said they handled their phone whilst riding to accept jobs because the way the system works, if you don't accept it within a certain time, you're kicked off the system. And that the app beeps to them to announce jobs. So this was a const constant distraction. And when we looked at the survey, 40% of those using an app found them distracting whilst driving or riding. Um, we had various statements that were created and looked at the percentage of agreement with them. So one of the statements was, we're looking at violations because violations, we know from all the psychological research are quite linked to actually being involved in crash. So these are kind of the interim risk factors, if you like. So for this one, I have driven through a red light when I've been under pressure because people did in their interviews um, say that they did this. So you can see um, the agree is the blue so you can see that pedal cyclists um, admitted to do this, uh, and so did two-wheeled motorized vehicles. That's what TWMV stands for. So people on mopeds, scooters, um, and motorbikes. 
In terms of speed, you know, the whole business model is predicated on people delivering quickly because the quicker you can do it, the more you can earn. So we asked them, the time pressure of gig work can make you travel over the speed limit. Um, so you can look at the two-wheeled motorized vehicles, the motorbikes and scooters and things, and there's a high level of agreement with that. And there's a fairly high agree agreement level with that from car drivers and, and pedal cyclists too. In terms of collisions, so we asked them, you know, has, has anyone been injured um, when they were working, um, driving or riding as a gig, gig worker? And the red is people say said yes. So you can see that, as we know, pedal cyclists and people on, on power two wheelers are very vulnerable. And these rates are much higher than you would expect. And generally, we, we said, you know, who was injured? Was it you or somebody else? And most of the time, it was the riders themselves that were injured. This is one of my favorite kind of models because it talks about really the, the latent conditions by which you know, we, we have loads of defenses like legislation and regulation which can protect workers. Um, but if these kind of defenses break down and all the holes in the Swiss cheese align, then we can have unsafe acts which can lead to collisions at, at the sharp end. So right at the upstream, the hazards are this kind of management deficiency. So that in my, from my perspective, there is no, there is no management of risk um, related to transport-based gig, gig workers. So I'm not expecting you to read all of this, but if we look at the kind of latent conditions, so it's things like there's no risk management or training for risk, there's no manager who cares, there is no accountability, it is time pressured. Okay, it's self-regulated, but therefore there is no control on the hours that people are riding or driving. It's incentivized and piece rate based. And we had in the narratives of some of the pedal cyclists that they were actually said, you know, you'll get a high pay, it's cold and icy out there. You know, we will pay you a higher rate of pay if you get out there. Um, you know, into conditions that we know are very adverse. So it's app-based work, so it's, it's all about the distraction. Um, people working for multiple companies, so there is no monitoring of driving hours. And as I said, they're incentivized to work in adverse weather. So these create physical and mental workload, long hours, pressure to deliver quickly to earn more money, no risk management or training, a distracting work interface, and adverse working conditions. And the un unsafe acts related to fatigue, falling asleep and violations, speeding, red light running, and distraction. This is one of my favorite um, graphs. It comes from Patrick Hudson's uh, paper on how a safety culture is generated. So if we think of something like the aviation in uh, industry, we would think about a generative safety culture. So this is about leadership. Safety is, is how we do business around here. So it's generative. Now, I would say, that the gig economy, and actually Jake used the word pathology and pathological in terms of safety culture. Who cares as long as we're not caught? So that is my deep concern about this business model. And, you know, I recognize everything that Jake said in the, in the narratives of the people that we spoke to. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. Uh, I think that um, I, I hope that you can hear me well now. I think that uh, before there have been some disruptions. I can hear you better now. Yep. <laughs> okay, that's very good. Um, well, I think that uh, the point of view that uh, that you take in your in your study is a is a very important one uh, to showcase, and also a very significant one to consider uh, for policymakers when uh, when drafting uh, when drafting regulation. Uh, you you mentioned how platforms. Uh, in their workers' manager, management with regards to health and safety are much more focused on, uh, on compensation uh, than, than prevention, actually, mm -hmm. with, uh, with higher rates for night shifts and so. And um, at the end of your paper, um, uh, which, which I read with, uh, with much interest, you, you make several recommendations, uh, yes. both to regulators and to, and to platform workers and to platform companies. Um, if you had to pick one uh, as the most impactful one to, to prevent risky behavior, which one would it be? Or maybe maybe two, or um, mention a couple of them. 
Well, I think people, I think you need to depressurize the work so that people actually get um, a guaranteed wage and they're paid for time, for a time slot and not per gig. So anything that depressurizes work. And I think there has to be, to create a safety culture, you need a personal relationship with somebody, you know, a manager who cares about your safety. Nobody cares about people's safety here. And safety, 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 safety always becomes like, you know, something that's often forgotten. And so in a lot of the reviews, that the kind of health and safety aspect has not been talked about. So I think I'm currently doing some work for our, the UK Department of Transport that's looking at non-gig motorcycle delivery workers and the gig workers and the narrative is completely different. So the people that are working for, they have a personal relationship with someone in the company. Um, there is a team spirit, there is care, and they're even questioned. Some of them in the narratives, they're actually questioned. You know, you did that a bit quickly. I'm, you know, I'm not going to give you a delivery if you carry on like that. So completely opposite. So I just think the whole business model is, as I said, pathological. And you hear about Uber, for example, having heads of road safety. We know there's a head of road safety for in London, but, you know, what are they doing? And I just think it's all about analysing the profits and analysing the risks. And people really need to say this is not acceptable. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. Yes, this is a uh, this really goes to uh, the core of uh, platform companies uh, mm -hmm. and business and labor models. And as we mentioned, uh, mentioned before, um, for sure, uh, I can uh, I can totally agree that uh, the pace of work must not conflict with uh, with health and safety mm -hmm. uh, for workers, which is <clears throat> unfortunately not yet the case. And uh, and I really uh, like the um, the point you made about uh, um, how peace work is one of the cornerstone of this um, of this uh, business and and labor model, which um, actually uh, incentivizes um, drivers and uh, yeah. uh, couriers to uh, to take risky behavior. Um, one, thing I, one thing I'd yeah. also like to say about that is that, uh, and um, the other speakers have alluded, is that during pandemic. A lot of people have lost their jobs and current work research that I'm doing that was after the, the initial paper that I did is that there are lots of different groups of workers. So there are people that are want a bit of extra money. But there are people that are desperate for money who need to pay their rent and put food on the table. And so there are different segments and some of these workers really enjoy the flexibility for a bit of additional cash, even in relation to a full time job. But there is a, a, a growing core. Of very desperate people and I think you know I've ha heard the word people saying that it's like slave labor and you know people are desperate we, we really need to put this we really need to have some big questions about this yes indeed uh, thank you very much uh, Nicola for your uh, very useful and insightful uh, contribution and uh, we now come to our last but uh, but definitely not least presentation uh, of the session I would welcome on stage uh, Petra Pirklova from the European Commission on GMP, uh, who is currently involved uh, in an initiative called Improving the Working Condition in Platform Work. And uh, we are very interesting, uh, interested to know more about this. Petra, the floor is yours. Uh, first of all, many thanks uh, for the invitation to this uh, interesting conference. I feel really privileged to be uh, here today. Um, so let me just start with uh, uh, saying that the Commission work program for 2021 announces a legislative initi initiative to improve uh, working conditions in platform work. Um, in this uh, new initiative, we are looking at uh, platform work as a growing phenomenon um, that has uh, potential to spread uh, further, um, both in terms of numbers of workers and different economic sectors in the EU. Um, in my presentation today, I will first say a few words about uh, what we mean by platform work and uh, um, what is the current state of play uh, in, uh, of platform work in the EU. Uh, then I will uh, speak briefly about um, uh, work challenges uh, that Commission has identified. And finally, I will say if uh, I will speak about the state of play of the Commission initiative and the next steps. 
So if we can go to the first slide. Um, perfect. Uh, so first of all, what we mean by platform work uh, for our initiative, um, we are focusing on so-called digital labor platforms that are providing uh, personal work. So um, we are not talking about platforms where people sell goods or rent properties. Um, and also we don't uh, look at purely collaborative platforms that provide uh, voluntary work or where people just exchange uh, goods for free. So the remuneration is an important uh, feature here. Um, we distinguish between um, on location platform work, um, which is delivered uh, physically, uh, for example, in passenger transport, food delivery or domestic work and online platform that is uh, completely virtual, for example, encoding of data, translation work, um, IT or design projects. Um, now, uh, what is the situation of platform work in the EU? We can go to the next slide. First, uh, have a look at the size of uh, platform economy. Um, according to the recent uh, study, the digital labor platform economy in the EU has grown almost fivefold in the last five years. Um, and on location services um, represent uh, over 90% of platform work in the EU, while taxi and delivery services um, account for 67% of this on location work. Um, have a look at the now, have a look at the impact of uh, COVID 19. Um, so, um, the pandemic has led to a 35% decrease of uh, passenger transport services, but on the other hand, uh, uh, 290 to 25 for growth in food delivery services. And we could see that the, the companies were adjusting their uh, delivery models. Um, three quarters of active labor platforms um, are originate in the EU, but if we look at the earnings, it's about 50-50 uh, for the EU and non-EU platforms. Now, uh, at the next slide, we can have a look at the uh, people who are uh, providing services via platforms. Uh, if we can move to the next slide. Um, so um, while uh, the, the data um, uh, on the platform workers are rather scarce, the Joint Research Center uh, provided a research that shows that ar around 11% of EU workforce or 24 million people has uh, provided uh, services via platforms at least once, uh, and uh, 3 million uh, uh, do, the, do this as their main job. Um, people working through platforms have uh, diverse socioeconomic backgrounds. Uh, in average, they are 10 years younger than workers in traditional economy, and they are also highly educated, although um, around 90% of, of work uh, is uh, low skilled, so we can see uh, there is a skills uh, mismatch, and many of them have a migrant background. Uh, the next slide then uh, shows um, the triangular relationship, uh, which is typical for the for the uh, platform economy uh, between the, the platform, the, the client and the person who is uh, providing the service via platform. And uh, um, over 90% of uh, people who work in uh, uh, digital labor pl platforms are self-employed, self while on the other hand, um, uh, about 70% of them consider themselves to be employees. So these uh, discrepancies again suggest an uncertainty about the employment status um, even among uh, among platform workers themselves. Uh, the next slide then shows the the challenges in platform work. So on it was mentioned already by other speakers that platform work creates many opportunities. It provides additional jobs, income for people who might have uh, otherwise difficulties to enter labor market. Um, and it also provides flexibility who want to combine work with family obligations or or studies. Um, but there are, of course, uh, important uh, challenges and uh, and uh, other speakers, Jake and, and, and all the other speakers are, have spoken already in detail about them. So let me just highlight maybe three points which are uh, related to, to our initiative. So first of all, uh, the employment status and uh, working conditions. Uh, so indeed, uh, employment status matters as it means uh, responsibilities for platforms and uh, labor rights uh, for workers. Um, 
90% of people working through platforms do not uh, qualify to, for the same protection as uh, workers in traditional economy because they are considered by platforms as independent contractors, although it does not uh, correspond to the actual relationship um, uh, in many cases that they have with, with the platform. Um, this brings uh, often the precarious conditions, uh, people work long hours, uh, they don't take any breaks, uh, uh, they might exceed speed limits, and we, we've heard all of that already. Um, and it has also health and uh, safety implications. Uh, secondly, um, the employment status is also linked with uh, better access to social protection. So we have seen that uh, during the pandemic, some platform workers and riders continued to work in despite being sick because they did not have uh, access to sickness insurance. And the third point I'd like to make is the um, algorithmic management, which is uh, typical for platform work. And as we know, so platforms use sophisticated apps that not only match uh, <clears throat> supply and demand uh, for work, but also collect uh, various data um, in order to, to monitor the users, evaluate, direct their work. Um, <clears throat> workers may be dependent on the algorithms for task allocation, pay levels, performance uh, assessment, and they can also be impacted on psychological level, for example, through nudging. Uh, platforms encourage the riders to continue working despite um, uh, fatigue or bad weather conditions. And now uh, let me say a few words uh, about um, the upcoming EU initiative. If we can move to the next slide. Mm. In the area of uh, working conditions, the EU treaty obliges a formal two-state consult consultation of European social partners. Um, at uh, each of these stages, the social partners have the possibility to enter into negotiations and only if they decide not to negotiate, the Commission may put forward uh, its uh, proposal. Um, the first uh, stage consultation was running from fe uh, February until 7th of April and uh, both uh, trade unions and employers' organizations agreed with the identified uh, challenges in platform work, but uh, of course they see um, the possible solutions uh, differently. So trade unions on the one hand are calling for a binding EU level instrument that would uh, focus on ensuring the correct employment status classification of people working through platforms. Um, wh while employer organizations consider that the existing EU instruments already provide adequate framework and that employment classification should be left for the courts and for national level to tackle. In the second stage uh, consultation of social partners, we will ask uh, their views on the content of a possible initiative. And in the next slide, just a few, a few, um, few dates. Um, so the uh, we are aiming to launch the second uh, stage consultation next week. Um, actually, on uh, Tuesday, this uh, point is on the college uh, agenda on the 15th of June, and it will be open until 15th of September. Um, if uh, social partners do not uh, decide to negotiate, the Commission will present a legislative proposal by the end of uh, 2021. Um, at this stage, it's uh, too early to say what form or content uh, such a proposal would have, but uh, uh, the overall objective would be to improve working conditions while promoting uh, sustainable development of uh, platform work. And uh, for now, we are just looking forward for, to get uh, further views from the social partners, and I would be also glad to, to, to hear any uh, other opinions uh, on the subject. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Petra. <clears throat> uh, it's um, it's interesting when you um, when you have uh, um, mentioned that uh, um, um, employers uh, union are uh, would like to go in the direction of uh, leaving uh, this um, uh, this topic and this decision on um, on national courts decision because as we have seen uh, in the last uh, in the last year in the last couple of years. These judgments at a uh, national level have routinely, uh, routinely found that there is no reason why workers should be excluded from uh, from labor protection and also from self employ uh, from uh, employment uh, uh, full employment status. Um, 
But um, I would like to, uh, to maybe ask, uh, probably it is too early to say, but uh, in order to, uh, it's, it's very important uh, uh, to, um, uh, to look forward to this, uh, to this um, commission legislative proposal in order to uh, finally uh, counter uh, bogus self-employment uh, models. And uh, um, what do you think are, um, what are the, the scenarios that uh, the commission envisages for the for the legal classification of uh, of platform workers, are we moving uh, as uh, also international uh, um, confederation of uh, European confederations of uh, trade unions uh, envisage towards the presumption of employment and uh, and uh, reversal of the burden of proof? Um, it is a very relevant question, but indeed, uh, as uh, as you said, it's a bit pity we don't have this uh, conference one week later because we are still uh, waiting for the for the launch of the social partners uh, consultation so i cannot go so much into detail but uh, just to mention that um, indeed we will be um, very um, interested in the in the views of the social partners who have until 15th of sep september to submit uh, their uh, their their opinions and as you said uh, the employment status is going to be at the core of of the e initiative and the mass classification of uh, um, in platform work will be will be one of the important initiative uh, one of the important points that the initiative will aim at tackling uh, you also mentioned the court cases so we have identified some 150 uh, legal cases in nine member states where employment uh, status was at stake and as you said in in majority of them uh, the the courts particularly the courts of the highest instance uh, they they found employment status mis misclassification although there were also a few cases which uh, confirmed the the self employment status it's uh, it's fair to say um and uh, of course we we are considering the different options uh, while i cannot go into details of them uh, today but as you rightly say the the trade unions were calling for the rebuttable presumption uh, combined with the re reverse the burden of proof so this might be one of the options that uh, we will seek the, the 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 social partners views on but they are also and these are also of course the the strongest ones but we are also looking into other options so there are still several several options at place and um, as uh, as we have already mentioned, uh, ninety percent of these peoples are are, are self-employed, so they don't have access to the to the labor rights and to social acquis. So this tackling this misclassification will be certainly uh, one of the the, the major issues. Uh, thank you, Petra, for uh, for this uh, uh, very very comprehensive answer. I would like to uh, uh, ask you uh, one more question. Um, we have seen also with uh, with Jamie's contribution that uh, uh, workers, uh, platform workers, are uh, increasingly organizing internationally, and uh, this has led also to the to the formation of um, of new um, uh, types of union, more grassroots, uh, more bottom up, uh, also at international level. For example, the uh, transnational federation of Korea, and uh, these unions might be better placed uh, to, to represent certain type of, uh, of platform workers uh, rather than uh, traditional uh, unions. Um, are you planning also to, to, consult, uh, to consult this uh, uh, less uh, institutional, if, we, if I may say, but probably uh, more uh, relevant in some cases um, uh, unions? So let me just uh, start by saying that the Commission is indeed is uh, consulting the European Social Partners in uh, accordance with the Article 145 of uh, of the Treaty, who are representing European labour and uh, employer organisations, and the transport sector is uh, is of course also represented by the European Transport Workers uh, Federation. But apart from this uh, formal two-stage consultation, um, the Commission has also undertaken extensive exchanges with uh, stakeholders at all levels, including platform uh, companies, platform workers associations. So we've been in a in a continuous contact, and uh, there were also some dedicated meetings with uh, national platform workers associations uh, organized uh, last October. And I can say that the majority of the associations were representing delivery riders. 
Um, but uh, we, of course, continue with this uh, with this discussion uh, throughout the process, and um, the Commission services will will still engage with stakeholders when we finish uh, this formal uh, consultation with the European Social Partners, and we are planning to have uh, further meetings with. Uh, platforms uh, um, with with representatives of platforms uh, associations in the second half of uh, of September uh, thank you thank you very much uh, Petra and uh, I would like now uh, at this um, at this stage to uh, ask uh, uh, all the speakers to uh, to come back on our uh, virtual uh, stage for a final round of, um, of questions. Great. Uh, time uh, is almost uh, up. We still uh, have uh, 10 minutes in, uh, in our session. Uh, it's unfortunate because I would like to, to continue on uh, discussing on this topic. Uh, and I think uh, that uh, it's um, now maybe time for um, a uh, final round uh, of, um, of contributions. And uh, um, I would like to ask, especially uh, uh, to um, Jake, Jamie, and uh, Nicola in this uh, first, um, if you had uh, to make uh, one uh, recommendation or one or two uh, main recommendation to, to policymakers uh, at uh, local or national or even at European level, as we have uh, the chance to have the European Commission uh, here represented by, by Petra, what would you um, what would that be when uh, when uh, policymakers consider um, regulation uh, for platform workers, and maybe uh, um, starting with uh, uh, with Jake? Um, yeah, I think personally, from from my experience, one of the biggest I run into is kind of the insecurity of not knowing how uh, successful your shift's going to be if you have certain bills to pay, not knowing how many hours you're going to need to work uh, to make the money that you need to make. So I think it probably falls under um, some sort of work classification, but unpaid waiting times are sort of the bane of all of our existence in terms of you can be on. I was on for about five hours yesterday without receiving a single order. And it's you can set this time aside. Uh, you can make sure that you're going to dedicate a certain amount of time to it, but you can't be guaranteed anything. Uh, uh, you can't be guaranteed anything and you can't really go to anyone requesting that you get better shifts or anything because everything is internalized into this app so yeah i think it's something that uber have uh, they've at least been recommended i'm not sure if they've actually implemented it but uh pay time from when you actually log on to the app or other career companies like uh, just eat i think have started introducing contracts that are uh, more based on signing up to shifts a week in advance and just getting paid an hourly rate for those shifts or just having a minimum wage floor but a lot of it is just, yeah, I, I said so on the other day, like if you were a customer service um, person on the phones and you turned up to work and there were no complaints, you wouldn't expect to go like, oh, no pay for today. That's all right. Like that's your job to be waiting there and to, uh, to address any issues or in our case, any orders that may come up and the waiting time is a part of that. Indeed. And that's uh, also uh, reflected uh, this, uh, uh, the, um, um need for uh, the obligation for company from platform companies to uh, to pay from uh, uh, um, from the time in which workers log on the platform to the time um, uh, workers log off is also reflected in the recent uh, court decision uh, in the UK about uh, Uber drivers and hopefully this will be uh, um, a, a way forward that uh, that we can see also is picked up by other companies, uh, for example, the, the ones that you mentioned, uh, Just Eat, uh, and hopefully this uh, indeed will be, uh, will be an example that, uh, that will be taken also to, uh, by, um, uh, by other platforms, and, uh, and that shows that indeed uh, um, minimum uh, employment protection, su such as minimum wage, for example, as, uh, as, you, uh, as you mentioned, uh, can go hand in hand with the flexibility of logging in and logging on of the, of the platform uh, when, uh, when, when you want that. Thanks a lot, uh, Jake. Uh, maybe Jamie, would you like to uh, reflect on, on that as well? Yes, I, I mean, Jake's suggestion is very good and is, is the one I, I probably would have gone for 
uh, too, but I, I have a similar related suggestion, um, which there's the beginnings of a debate in uh, in the UK around this. There's a, an, a private member's bill uh, going into, into Parliament around this, but is to, rather than worrying about the regulation of self-employed work and how we deal with self-employment or in the UK worker status, is to put the onus instead on platforms to prove that people are genuinely self-employed um, and to give everybody working rights, whether they're self-employed, whether they're in intermediate status or, or whether they're employees. Um, you know, I think this is a much broader question than just transportation, just um, just food delivery, just, just, just taxi work. Uh, everyone who works should have fair employment rights. Um, and I think particularly around being able to uh, to organize collectively and to have a voice over their over their working conditions. Um, and I think this is a way just to cut across the kind of debates on is it self-employment? Is it not? Everybody should have these rights um, and should have a say over their work. Well, I think it's uh, impossible to to disagree with this, uh, Jamie. Um, Nicola. I would like to, I mean, the consumer part to play in this, demanding delivered at 11 o'clock at night um, to get their lukewarm pizza. But, you know, why? And I would like to get to is an ethical service so that they have to meet certain kind of service or quality. So there is someone that cares about people's safety jobs can potentially or people get paid for a time slot so anything that deep is why people you know people are using their phones when they're playing, um and you know that is actually against the law in in the uk so anything that and also if the consumer can see i'm going to choose this delivery service because it's doing all these things about workers safety and rights start making consumers demand service delivery standard if you like so anything that you know jake and jamie and have said i, I totally agree with um but you know we just shouldn't accept it's going to happen and it's except you know i think that's that from a road safety perspective because the bottom line is in life you know the basic life is that we want to be safe and then you could also talk about all the these workers face as well so i've heard stories of people their their, their vehicles being stolen and the goods being stolen keeping um stuff in their car get attacked so i think the safety of these workers is is absolutely paramount i agree completely with this and i really much like uh, your your point uh, uh, which i um which i share um for the possibility in the future um to uh for even local policy maker to to link the possibility of uh, platforms to operate uh, in their uh, in their jurisdiction uh to the guarantee of uh, of decent working conditions uh, via uh, tools like licensing or service level agreements as you as you mentioned uh nicola um Petra, uh, at last, would you like to uh, reflect and have a final brief uh, on this uh, on these recommendations that uh, our speakers uh, provided? So first of all, I would really like to thank for for all of these um, recommendations, uh, the 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 ideas, and of course, uh, we we've been hearing that uh, from from different uh, different uh, sides, uh, from from all kinds of uh, stakeholders. So uh, I very much uh, thank you thank you for that, and these are of course. Uh, questions that we've been very carefully considering in in, in the preparation of uh, this initiative maybe just to mention that there is a little bit different situation in the uk in terms of the um, employment status because indeed there is the worker status which is something in between the employee and uh, and self-employed uh, which is a bit different mm. uh, in the eu labor law so there indeed i mean we have um, more or less the choice between the two uh, two statuses uh, but it, uh, as I mentioned already, it's, uh, we consider it very, very important that the correct uh, classification is uh, put in place because indeed uh, the misclassification can, uh, can, uh, can lead to, 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 do, to precarious situations. 
and the, the, the correct uh, classification would uh, open the, the 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 floor for the for the labor rights and and social lucky for for workers who, who who need it so this would be maybe my final word thank you thank you petra and this is the uh, final take of uh, of this session uh, time is running out and uh, it's uh, 11 o'clock uh, brussels time uh, i would like to thank uh, our speakers uh, for these very insightful um, uh, contributions. And I hope uh, this was a, a thought-provoking session for, for, for participants. And I also invite you to follow the rest of the Urbanism Next Europe conference. Thank you very much and uh, have a good afternoon.